We are thrilled to introduce, to bring you, you an amazing panel with absolutely amazing participants. The panel is entitled Women and Gender in the Islamic World, Con Continuities and Transformations. Now I'm going to tell you how we're going to do this in the order that we're going to follow. Um, our first speaker will be Shireen Hafez. Shireen, Dr. Professor Hafez is a professor and currently department chair in the, the program of gender and sexuality at the University of California, Riverside. She is the co-editor of one of my favorite journals, the Journal of Middle East Women's Studies, which has been uh, it's been operating for a good 20 years and has produced a number of seminal materials on women, Islam, and the Islamic world. She has served as president of the Association of Middle Eastern Am Anthropologists. And her most recent book is entitled Women of the Maidan. The Untold Stories of Egypt's Revolutionaries, and it discusses the revolutionary women in Egypt who took part in the Arab awakening activities that revolutionized the way women are seen around the world, and I have a copy of it on my Kindle. She is the co-editor of the Anthropology of the Middle East and North Africa into the New Millennium and her articles have appeared widely. We are truly honored to have her here with us. Our second speaker will be joining us by Zoom from Senegal. Her name is Jamila Karim, and she is a prolific author and academic who formerly was a professor of religion at Spelman College. She is an award-winning author, lecturer, and as I said, a professor. Uh, professor Kareem specializes in race, in gender, and in the subject of Islam in America. At Spelman, she taught as an associate professor in the Department of Religious Studies. She has traveled widely with her family in Malaysia and throughout most of the, the Muslim world. And she has been writing a blog that is very energized, exciting, and thoughtful. She contributes articles on spirituality and Islam and was highlighted as a young faith leader in the black community by Jet Magazine. Her PhD is from Duke University in Islamic Studies. So, Shireen. Thank you for your kind introduction, Professor Donna Lee Bowen and Professor Grant Underwood, where are you? I can't see you with these glasses. Thank you for your invitation and um, for all the committee for inviting us here today. I'm so pleased to be on the enchanting campus of BYU again and to share with you some aspects of my research this time. My talk will draw on my work on women's Islamic movements, empowerment, and subjectivity. So as an anthropologist, I will really tell you a story. I will not try to give you a general sense of what gender in Islam is. What I'm going to ask you to do is to listen to the story, to the case study, and you can make your own conclusions. Um, so I take an approach that primarily relies on fieldwork and participant observation to verify my theoretical assumptions and often to debunk normative assumptions concerning Islam in the Middle East. My focus took me to a community of Islamic women activists in Cairo, Egypt. My objective then was to learn how, rather than why, women's Islamic activism develops and how we can understand it better. My interest had been piqued by the unprecedented feminist scholarship that was paid at the time to gender empowerment and women's status in Muslim-majority societies. 
While many studies rush to applaud the feminist potential of Islamic activism for improving women's status in Muslim-majority societies, others remain skeptical about the extent of my, any empowerment that Islam may offer women in Arab and Middle Eastern uh, Muslim societies. Viewed as misogynist and patriarchal to the extreme, Muslim-majority countries are often depicted as hostile to women, which has led some to claim that Islamic women activists buy into the very discourses that subjugate them. Further noting that women who join Islamic movements and organizations parrot their male leaders, and um, others maintain that Muslim activist women have access to leadership only under male supervision and command. In the midst of all these debates taking place on a transnational level, the Muslim women activists themselves hastened to reject completely the feminist label, insisting that their work was to gain God's favor and not to challenge patriarchal power or to covet it for themselves. This was an interesting moment for me to start my own research to figure out what was really going on. I collected fieldwork data over the course of several years, working with two Islamic women-run uh, private voluntary organizations, or PVOs, in Cairo, Egypt. Egypt is the most populous country in the Arab world. We like to say, as Egyptians, that uh, we are known for our humor and also, of course, our overpopulation. Cairo is where we most Egyptians congregate, so it's uh, quite a large North Af sit country situated in North Africa. Anyway, so the embodied mission and objectives of the women's Islamic movement in Egypt and many other centers elsewhere in the Middle Eastern region uh, is basically to represent, through their behavior, an ideal image of what a Muslim woman should be like. And through perfecting themselves, they also get to reform uh, society. The larger of the two PVOs where I conducted my research was called Al Hilal. It was run by a core group of women and a larger number of volunteers, about 200, who were not always permanent. Some of them were the core permanent group and others were uh, kind of freelancing. This particular organization belonged to a transnational network of women's Islamic organizations. The women's Islamic movement owes much of its success to this network, which continues to be its driving force. It maintained transnational ties with other organizations that often sent women activists to occasionally visit Al-Hilal. These networks were so far-reaching that when a devastating earthquake hit Pakistan in 2005, Al-Hilal, together with the sister organizations in Egypt, mobilized enough resources to send six 42-foot containers of relief food and clothing to Pakistan within two weeks of the disaster. The Muslim women activists I worked with embodied forms of empowerment that provide an Islamic alternative to general conceptions of empowerment in international development literature informed by universalist modern liberal norms. Women engaged in Islamically reforming their societies operate from within structures of authority which privilege men, paradoxically and often unintentionally finding themselves in positions of power by acting in accordance with prevalent norms of ideal female Muslim behavior. While women's roles shift to reflect their activism, they begin to assume privileges and statuses in society that can be assumed to be empowerment in a liberal modern sense. Yet, I argue, these shifts in roles and statuses are more complex and multilayered when viewed from the perspective of the women themselves. Their point of departure for this analysis for a more nuanced reading of the nature of their engagements with Islamic practice and often how they redraw the limits of normative gender roles. More importantly, we can also see how concepts of empowerment predicated upon universalist assumptions do not fully capture the impact of Islamic activism nor women's engagement with movements recognizing faith as an organizing principle. Islamic activism appeared to redefine not only women's, but also men's physical discursive space. As women became more active religiously and men's monopoly over the public religious domain began to be challenged, this produced conflict and tensions between men's and women's groups. These challenges were not, however, interpreted as gender struggles, and the successes or failures the women experienced were not viewed as power issues but were viewed as part of the struggle for piety and Islamic social reform leading to God's blessing. 
In some cases, I have observed in my fieldwork, the activist women's high level of religious piety and social respectability compelled, even obligated, male leaders to publicly endorse women's Islamic activism and to even cede some control over religious spaces and activities. Through the various forms of activism and social work that they do, acquiring a good grasp of Islamic teachings and conducting their Islamic practices and rituals accordingly, these activist women asserted their claims on this newly found space. Those claims intersect with socially acceptable gender norms, social values placed on age, education, and even the endorsement of government institutions and furthers their sense of self and enabled their pious work. These interventions do not, however, in and of themselves act as indicators or goals of empowerment for the Islamic activist women. In other words, assuming positions of power or acquiring control over space and resources do not appear to be goals pursued by activist women, but were first and foremost means to gaining piety and religious fulfillment. So now I'm going to give you just an overview of what this activist um, you know, endeavors are, or how these activist endeavors play out, what the women's Islamic movement in Cairo looks like, and so on. So for decades now, Islamic women have led an activist movement for social reform in Egypt, centered in the capital. They preach in mosques to other women. They teach classes in Islamic theology and law. They lead philanthropic activities and often organize large-scale funding events that fund their activism and educated women also lead um, the whole congregation in prayer, by the way. They've attracted much media attention, not all positive, and are considered authorities on issues dealing with Islam and gender, the family, and social and Islamic ethics. While many activist women preach informally, most of the well-known preachers are actually certified to teach by the Ministry of Religious Endowments. They attract thousands of city women around to hear their sermons. The majority of these women, da'ayet, which is preachers, do not adopt feminism in their outlook, nor do they have particular interest in addressing issues of gender equality. Their discourse is primarily aimed at perfecting the self through enhancing its relationship to God. Unlike their main uh, counterparts who are employed by the Ministry of Religious Endowments and therefore operate within the confines of the official government agenda, women's sermons focus on the daily needs of the modern Muslim woman. These needs include, but are not restricted to, raising children Islamically, conducting oneself according to Islamic teachings, and the various challenges of being Muslim in a globalizing and westernizing world. Their non-official capacity enables them to somehow freely address the issues that are relevant to them and to their audience, such as extramarital sex, birth control, abortion, and the like. These endeavors have created a momentum in society and has reversed some of the stereotypes about Islamic women being passive and oppressed, representations which often marginalized and denied them a role in the religious, social, and political aspects of government. With the growing trends in Islamism in Egypt before the revolution of 2011, and then again after the Muslim Brotherhood became the ruling party, Islamic women became more publicly engaged than ever before. Although the activist women on whom the study is based is not part of the Muslim Brotherhood whatsoever, the brief period during which the party were in control acted as a catalyst for the activism that was started prior to the revolution. They began conducting forms of dialogue to create awareness of the political situation. They even invited uh, people from community to learn about voting. Women generally don't vote in Egypt. And so they promoted voting. They taught women how to vote, etc. And so they were really involved in the political process. Now I turn to a discussion of empowerment to give you a sense of how empowerment is generally understood in development literature, primarily in United Nations discourse. Empowerment has become a commonly used term to refer to the ability of an individual to be enabled. That is to be free to exercise their power in decision making and in making choices which shape their future. Despite the universality of the term, however, few attempts have been made towards developing a definition of empowerment. Often viewed as problematic and ambiguous, the word empowerment is not easily translated because it does not exist in most languages. In the Arabic language, the term temkin refers to the state of being empowered. Yet it does not fully capture the notion of power and points instead to a state of being enabled 
Tamkin is employed in technical development language and is seldom, if ever, used in Arabic colloquial. Social understanding of Tamkin or power, as Maykana, have some negative associations with tyrannical power. Tamakkun, which is the verb, implies the ability to dominate. One study by Oxel and Baden provides an extensive survey of development organizations and NGOs that aims at understanding one of the term's usages, implications, and indicators. So according to Oxel and Baden, the notion of empowerment is derived from the birth of the idea of Western individualism. So they list a, a different you know, sort of uh, taxonomy of the word uh, empowerment from the word power itself. So power itself is as follows. Power over, relations of domination. Power to, which is the creative and enabling power. Power with, which centers around the organization of people to achieve collective good. And power within, which refers to self-confidence, awareness, and assertiveness. When development projects seek to empower women, they address specific criteria mainly derived from these standards or a combination of them. Criteria for women's development include participation in decision making, as well as the creation of an awareness among women that they may be entitled to occupy a decision making space in the public sphere, to make choices, to be able to shape their environment. Power is generally articulated as a possession and determines whether individuals are dominant or oppressed. Central to this vision of empowerment, which has gained impetus in development discourse, is the notion that power belongs to the individual rather than the collective. Entrepreneurship and individual self-reliance are emphasized over cooperation as means of challenging power structures which are seen as subordinating women. Many of these assumptions regarding empowerment emerge from the modern liberal conception of the individual, which are often inapplicable to community-based societies. In contrast to the liberal modern reading of empowerment prevalent in development discourse, the Islamic women activists that I worked with in Cairo find an empowerment from within such relations of power. They subscribe to Muslim feminine ideals demonstrating that women are not merely subjugated in relations of power but are indirectly empowered as a result of the dynamics in these relationships. As Islamic women preach modesty and emphasize traditional feminine roles, they exemplify the very qualities that liberal theorists call for replacing with independence, freedom against oppression, uh, sexual liberty, and freedom from gender uh, discrimination. The Muslim women activists I worked with were more concerned with something else. Theirs was the project that began with the self as a site for social development. To these women, activism as a service to others lies at the heart of this process. Most development theories and schools of feminist thought define strategies as resistance, contesting male authority, as paths for women's empowerment. While these are paths that are not entirely absent from the experiences of the women uh, I worked with, resistance, autonomy, and independence in themselves were often necessary means to attaining the larger goal of social change. In fact, the tensions between the pursuit of a religious ideal that women define as being closer to their God often intersected with such liberal feminist ideals. These tensions and negotiations between what are often perceived as conflicting traditions are far more complex and complementary than they are dichotomous. The various forms of empowerment that Islamic activist women experience in their movements are born out of these creative tensions and intersections. While Islamic activism occasionally places women in positions that challenge male authority, such as, for instance, competition over resources or public spaces where they preach, or social reform projects where male religious leaders may have led in the past, the general consensus is that this is acceptable as long as these efforts are for the general good. The gender ideology that informs this general consensus is based on an Islamic model that emphasizes the complementarity of the different roles of women and men rather than their absolute equality. They are, in other words, equal but different. The goal is to affect harmony and balance in society with the belief in the justice of God as the ultimate judge of all things in the world. 
Yet many of the women I interviewed who worked in Islamic social reform organizations often experienced a kind of empowerment in remaking themselves as ideal Muslim women. For instance, Sel Selma, one of the leaders at an is Islamic center for women, recounts that empowerment is related to her sense of success, self-enhancement. She spoke about how she undertakes a strict disciplinary attitude towards her sense of religiosity. Islam acts as a constant frame of reference to her in every action of the day. Selma explained how she sets high standards for herself because she is a da'iya, preacher. She was reluctant to talk about her empowerment as we discussed the various manifestations of the concept in her opinion. After some minutes into our discussion, Selma finally said, you know, if it weren't for the fact that this concept is so important to you, I would never mention this to anyone. Saying that I am empowered is in direct contradiction to what I represent as a da'iya. My duty is to be modest and unassuming. It is true that my religious role gives me a sense of power and achievement compared to those who involve themselves in trivialities, but to, talking about it should just not be done. It's against the spirit of Islam. Others, like Karima, a younger woman in her 30s, described a sense of well-being inspired by her relationship with God. To her, Islam is about how you treat others and about how you translate your faith into action. Though at first she was never really interested in Islamic practice beyond what is daily ritual, she began paying attention to Islamic social work taking place in her neighborhood after her return from a short pilgrimage to Mecca. She started by attending classes in Islamic theology, which introduced her to Islamic social work. Karima echoed the voices of many women at Al-Hilal. The knowledge she gained in her Islamic classes enabled her to be a well-learned individual who not only managed her home life but well, but she also began to volunteer at the center by teaching arts and crafts to children. When asked how she found the time to do all this, Karima laughed, saying that Al-Hilal's teachings improved her time management skills. As she described how, Karima was emphatic, quote, when you follow God in your heart and you know what he wants and you aspire to do it, everything falls into place. Your life, including your kids, your husband, and your home, seem to fit together. You are able to perform much better at all these things. You are responsible for and more. You also help other women learn about their religion, unquote. Karima teaches others about Muslim ideals of womanhood that focus on closeness to the divine, dedication to Islamic teaching, knowledge and learning. As a teacher, she embodies these values to her fellow activists. I had similar discussions with other activists, such as Maha, a wife and mother in her 40s. Maha was a high achiever. She graduated at the top of her class and worked as an assistant professor for a short time before she moved on to banking. She now dedicates her time to Islamic activist work and is one of the leaders at the center. Maha was the epitome of patience and care, even when faced with the most challenging situations. Attempting to understand what activism meant to her, I asked her how she would feel if she were to stop her activist work. Startled by the question, she stared back as if she, the thought never crossed her mind till that moment. Then she said, quote, it will affect my relationship to God if I do not perform these acts of kindness. It will sever a strong link to God. I cannot see myself without this. This activism is a reward that God has sent me. I would feel deprived from a privilege that I tremendously enjoy to help others and attend to their needs. Maha interprets the satisfaction she gets from Islamic activism as a divinely given privilege. In this, her views seem to parallel many of the Islamic activist women I spoke with. To them, Islamic social work is a gift from God and a way to piety. Activism is not a conscious pursuit for fame or social recognition. Far from it. In fact, this work was about placing their will and agency in the hands of God. Any empowerment, therefore, which emanates from these activities is not understood in this rationale as a direct consequence of the action, but rather as born out of the religious experience. Using the word in English, I asked Maha what it meant to her and how she would define empowerment. Her response deflected from any possible confusion that I might have about conflating empowerment with autonomy or agency. She continued to explain that Islamic activist women enjoy positions of authority, such as a director of the organization, but that these situations develop as these women succeed in achieving high positions uh, in or high levels of religious knowledge, and as they themselves become role models for others who respect and admire them. But Maha here is using empowerment to mean power over others in an authority sense. 
Salma used empowerment to mean a higher level of self-confidence and assurance. However, neither of them sees empowerment as a goal of their Islamic activism. Rather, they see it both as a natural outcome of religious duty as well as of activism. Maha explains, quote, these women do not covet power. What they seek is a religious perfection, which will bring them closer to God, unquote. This image of religious perfection is, however, defined and articulated by discourses which rest on patriarchal sources of Islamism. There are two main theoretical problems that Islamic women activists pose to liberal feminist conceptions of empowerment. First, they belong to a tradition, Islam, which is perceived as being oppressive to women, generally interpreted as a patriarchal religion which favors males over females. They fit into a generalized feminist stereotype of oppressed women. Secondly, Islamic women activists endorse a gender ideology that is not predicated upon a universal feminist view of gender equality as means for women's empowerment. Instead, they emphasize in their daily activities their religious zeal, virtue, and high levels of moral ideals as prescribed means to self-enhancement. These women had varying viewpoints about gender relations, and many uh, even did not consider the matter of gender difference as an issue in Islam. The majority of them see that God created the female and male to complement one another, to fulfill different roles in society, which are outlined in the Quran. Islamic women do not converge on the issue, but they are clear on the fact that men and women are different. They view the relationship between wife and husband to be based on responsibilities as well as obligations so that a harmonious and equitable relationship prevails in the family and both partners enjoy the rights which Islam has decreed for them. Many of them maintain that the Quran never restricted roles based on gender and argue that motherhood, though most certainly an honored position in the Quran, was never presented as a sole option for women. The vigorous involvement of Islamic women in the public sphere to Islamically reform society in Muslim-majority countries, uh, such as Egypt, could not be generalized as an act of feminist empowerment, which would obscure the nuances and the complexities of pious activism undertaken by women. Although women's Islamic activism has shifted their position in society and has redrawn the boundaries for gender roles in ways typically identified with feminist outcomes, this interpretation glosses over the women's desires and aspirations for pious fulfillment and religious service. A sense of empowerment is not altogether absent from these women's lives, nor should we assume that Islamic engagement leads to the polar opposite of empowerment at a liberal, in a liberal modern sense. It's important to consider, though, that liberal modernist criteria for empowerment that advocate for independence and autonomy as markers of the modern individual who is free to choose an identity and lifestyle, regardless of the social fabric in which they live, cannot adequately criticize critically analyze an empowerment for women whose worldview is not consistent with this type of ethos. Theirs is a sort of empowerment contingent upon relinquishing the forms of power that derive from overt resistance and relies instead on socially cogent notions of perseverance, cooperation, and the attainment of higher levels of religiosity. Working both inwards to hone their pious selves as well as outwards in their communities to reform them Islamically, activist Muslim women see these efforts as inseparable from their faith and their worship. Despite what these experiences bring to their own lives, neither the sense of pride in what they do, nor the acquired confidence from working on social reform are in themselves their coveted reward. Clearly, a consideration of empowerment which regards this subject as created by social relations, not as autonomous from them, provides a more lucid understanding of the impact of Islamic activism on women's lived experience and provide a better understanding of empowerment as a unit of analysis for future development projects. Thanks for listening. My parents converted to Islam from Christianity in 1971. Like most Black converts of that era, they joined Islam through a Black liberation movement called the Nation of Islam. It taught that Islam was the original religion of their ancestors 
and that converting would restore to African-Americans the noble identity that was stripped from them in slavery. My parents married shortly after converting. And by the time I was born, they had come to identify with the global community of Muslims. That means Muslims from Senegal, Somalia, Morocco, Egypt, India, Pakistan, and Malaysia, to name a few Muslim countries. But I wouldn't truly experience the richness I lived a very unique Black American cultural expression of Islam in a very vibrant and loving community in Atlanta, Georgia. Now, fast forward to the present. This is a picture of a Muslim woman in Cameroon, West Africa. By the way, she is a billionaire in her. First, let me just say, how come this isn't the image of Africa that we see in the media? There's a backstory to how I came across this picture. Just a few nights ago, I stood in the courtyard of a mosque in Medina Bay, a small town, but also a religious or an international religious center in Senegal, where I have been living since January, taking a spiritual retreat from life in the US. Stood next to me as we both waited for our spiritual guide, a Senegalese sheikh, to exit the mosque. The young man, also in Medina Bay for spiritual renewal, exchanged contact info with me. And this photo came up as his WhatsApp profile picture, a picture of his stunningly beautiful mother. He noticed my profile pic immediately too. This slide of the two of us side by side, two black Muslim women, the exact same age, but two very different worlds capture some of what I, I hope to impart tonight or this morning, it's nighttime here, the appeal of Islam and the myths while winning women's hearts. The setting of the magical Medina by Mas courtyard, which includes the mausoleum that you see on the left of the slide, is a great work on how African-American Muslim women love and live Islam navigating Islamic gender rules and norms in light of family, community, and work. Here in Medina Bay, experiencing Islam lived in a culture different from my own. It is as though I am seeing Islam with new eyes, very much like a convert. And interestingly, the women whom I center in my research are converts, formerly Christian women who came to Islam. Black Christian women, in contrast to white women, have always demonstrated a unique ability to see beauty in Islam. And what's so striking is that what I see of Islam with fresh eyes and what I love about Medina Bay parallels much of what Black Christian women have found appealing about Islam in America. I've captured what I love through th three things, all of them most vividly experienced in the sacred space of the mosque. Hands down, what I love the most about the mosque complex in Medina Bay, Senegal, is that young Black men dominate the space. Women are there and are highly visible, but men outnumber them by far. In the slide is a picture at the tomb, which women frequent. And if you look closely on the right end, you can see a woman in a yellow hijab sitting among other women. Also, notice the man standing in blue with a white scar. Senegalese men regularly wear this covering that looks like a hijab and in various colors. Now, as someone who occasionally identifies as an Islamic feminist, it might be surprising to hear that I love the way men hold most of the sacred space. Perhaps this paradox is the perfect place to pose an important question. Whose definition of women's liberation are we using to judge Islam? Whose story are we telling? Is it Muslim women's story, Black women's? Neither. It is white Christian women's. White women are the ones who have crafted the dominant narrative of women's liberation in this country. Because white women's place had been in the home, 
Liberation for them meant breaking out of domestic confines and gaining equal access to jobs and wages, as well as other public spaces led by men. Indeed, this sounds like freedom, but in reality, it has not been for black women. Unlike white women, African-American women have had much more to worry about than discrimination based on gender. Black women have told a very different story of women's liberation. Racism affects our lives so profoundly and pervasively that we cannot effectively address sexism without addressing racism. I appreciate the way that activist and poet Nikki Giovanni captures this difference in the stories of feminism, where Black women were not even seen as a female body to be protected, but rather a Black body to be exploited. Giovanni stated, when we look at the history of slavery, we have a whole situation where no one cared if you were woman or not. You had to get out into the field. After freedom, no one cared if you were a woman or not. You had to work to support your family. So that's one of the problems with women's lib in relation to Black women. They look at themselves as women, but we've had to look at ourselves as Black. Giovanni is right to begin with slavery to understand why Black and white women see feminism differently. Black women's beginnings in this country were defined by unrelenting work for white people. Washing, ironing, cooking, scrubbing, sewing, mending, hoeing, plowing, digging, planting, pruning, patching, to borrow words from Margaret Walker's famous poem, For My People. Jacqueline Jones in her book, Labor of Love, Labor of Sorrow, Black Women Work in the Family notes that sun up to sundown is the expression commonly used to describe the work hours of the enslaved. For Black women, it was dawn to midnight. After tending the fields, they began their night work for their own families and communities. All this means that going to work is not the meaning of liberation for Black women. Black women have always worked. What I have discovered among Black Christian women across generations is that they assess Islam based on their own stories of women's liberation, shaped primarily by racism. Black women are sensitive to the ways in which racism functions as a broader injustice that infects an entire community, women, men, and children. Hence, our feminism also takes into account how racism has affected Black men and how that affects affects our lives as women. So take for instance, my intro to Islam student at Spelman, a historically black college for women. I had them visit a mosque and report their observation. Again and again, these young black Christian women noted the men and how abundantly present they were. One student described the, the men in the mosque as a beautiful sight to see and noted so many young ones. She wrote, it was beautiful to see so many black males peacefully gathered together, shaking hands and greeting each other with respect and love. Their unity opposes the popular media images that convey that black men are divided. The women notice the men because their experience is that women dominate men in the church. Across denominations, women make up over 60% of church congregants. Young single men are even less likely to attend church. The predominance of men in the mosque has to do with the gendered rule in Islam. Muslim men are required to attend the Friday congregational prayer, whereas it is optional for women. In the mosque where I grew up, which is in the slide, men make up 60% of the Friday congregants the opposite of the church. Since I grew up accustomed to men attending the mosque in large numbers, I was not expecting men's presence in the mosque to be the big deal that it was for some of my students. However, when I traveled to Medina by synagogue, I understood fully their delight with black men's sizable presence in sacred space. In the sacred space of Medina by, I see a flood of black men around the clock as worshipers and lovers of God and Prophet Muhammad. Several cultural markers here amplify their spirituality, including their dress, which is modest, often regal, fitting for the divine. They're always carrying dicker beads, which you see in the photo. The man is holding white dicker beads. 
which are used for daily devotions and their constant presence in sacred space, no matter the time of day or night. But also I know that my pleasure with men's predominance in this space has to do with how black men are portrayed in the media, similar to the way the Spellman student highlighted that seeing black males peacefully gathered together opposes popular media images. Indeed, to see black men not as bodily threats, the way they see them in America, but as spiritual aspirants is relief to my eyes and I must say satisfaction to my soul. This is so because the demonizing images of black men and boys has a huge emotional impact on our hearts as women who fear that our husbands or brothers will be victims of police brutality or our sons among the one out of three black boys who will one day be incarcerated, all because black males are assumed guilty the instant they see them. Because my heart and soul yearn to see black men in their best image as servants of God, to see young men flood the sacred spaces of Medina Bay takes on extraordinarily positive meaning for me. The gender rule that has resulted in men's larger presence in the mosque is related to two other gender rules in Islam that essentially position men as leaders over women. The rule that only men can lead the congregational prayer and the obligation for men, not women, to financially support their families. Of course, these both align with Christianity and have also made Islam very attractive to black women. One convert expressed, that attracted me that women were not being directed to go out and take care of the family. When you are in a hard situation, you are definitely being prepared to take care of yourself and work side by side with the man. But you don't wanna to have to do that if you don't have to. So Islam offered an option for women. And for our ethnic group, that was like what we wanted to hear. It was what Black women wanted to hear because as discussed earlier, Black women have always been in a hard situation in this country. And as a result, have always been side by side with men in every realm and regularly leaders ahead of men, surpassing them in both worldly and spiritual pursuits. As is the case with Black Christian women, most Black Muslim women work outside the home and assume an equal or larger share of work in their mosque communities, serving as directors of community schools, editors of newspapers, and organizers of mosque fundraisers. Precisely because Black women have been in the forefront all their lives, they find appeal in a religion that pushes men to be leaders and makes optional for women the family leadership and community involvement that they are accustomed to particularly in the church. One woman expressed, I just love men's leadership because this is a natural role that they are supposed to take. And you know, it's so comfortable to be able to have leadership like that because we as women have experienced having to be the head of the household and having to make all decisions and work and distribute the money doing all that. And men are supposed to have that kind of leadership in the community, so I love it. For Black women, women's liberation is the freedom from having to do it all, including traditionally men's work. The second theme connecting what I love about Islam in Senegal with Black American Muslim women is eye-catching but modest dress. I call the woman in this slide Muslim Cinderella. This picture was taken on a Friday morning at the tomb. Here in Senegal, men and women dress up all the time, every day, and especially in sacred space. Culturally, Senegalese dress up not to show off, but to show their respect for others. Similar to how in American culture, we dress up for important people or special occasions. The difference perhaps is that in a Sunni, or, or rather a Sufi Muslim culture like Senegal, where saints or the friends of God, as Muslims call them, are abundant and everywhere, it is fitting to dress up all the time. Also, as Sufism teaches, one never really knows whether or not a person is a friend of God. So every encounter is one to show respect and dress well. Senegalese women wear the most vibrant colors and striking patterns, which defies the conservative norm that women should ideally wear neutral, solid colors. 
donning head wraps and wide scarves that match their dresses, Senegalese women gracefully show that modesty rules in Islam do not diminish style or beauty. Similarly, Black American women have navigated Islamic modesty rules in ways that make piety look fashionable and desirable. But before forging their own fashion, just the look of piety attracted many Black women to Islam. And again, the reason piety appealed to them goes back to slavery. From the beginning, Black women were stereotyped as innately promiscuous to deny them the protection that white women were afforded and to justify the systematic violence against them. So even before coming to Islam, Black women, or when Black women put on a long dress, they were doing more than covering their bodies. They were demanding respect as they fought against stereotypes of them as sexually loose, essentially attempting to protect themselves. Muslim modesty fashioned a new type of respect even from their own men. One woman stated, the nation of Islam gave me some awareness that there were a group of men who respected women who covered and who, and who called black women queens and all these other beautiful things that we didn't hear in the streets at that time. African-American women easily embraced modesty, but now met the challenge of making it their own. The dominant image of Muslim women's modesty in the 1960s was the nation of Islam's women's uniform, which borrowed symbols of purity from Christianity, the faith closest to home. As you can see, the uniform resembles the head covering of nuns. By the mid-1970s, there were two relevant developments. One, the nation of Islam abandoned its Black liberation teachings for global Islam, forming the largest national community of African-American Muslims. And two, an influx of Muslim immigrants from Asia and Africa brought their own cultural forms of Islam to America. Imam Warzi Muhammad, the leader of the transformed Black Muslim community, discontinued the women's uniform and encouraged women to come up with dress styles that were Americanized in contrast to dress Muslim immigrants brought from their home countries. The two hijab styles that evolved were the scar tied around the back and the African head wrap. By the way, hijab is more of an immigrant Muslim term. I grew up calling the covering a scar. Even in the nation of Islam, women wore the scarf loosely tied with bangs slipping through the front. Over time, the scarf without bangs and the head wrap dominated as the most popular hair covering. But the presence of Muslim immigrants inspired a range of hijab looks. One sister expressed, we had the Senegalese sisters with all their headwear on, and then we had a lot of the immigrant sisters from Pakistan and Egypt. So the khimar or scarf wrapped or draped around the neck came in and sisters were doing that beautifully. We had so many influences that you could pretty much come with any style. And then we had African-American sisters who were designers coming up and developing their own fashion wear for sisters of African-American background so that they have their own expression. American clothes, either store bought or handmade eventually predominated as the style that came to characterize the black Muslim women. Short dresses over pants is one example of what women came up with in buying clothes at the store. One woman recalled this look as very attractive. This dedication to American Muslim dress styles made fashion shows popular in Black Muslim communities. They served as fundraisers for communities and a means to support Black women-owned businesses. But perhaps the greatest impact of the shows was making the younger generation of American Muslims excited about covering. When I reached my teens, the last thing I wanted to do was cover my hair. Unlike the women of my mother's generation who wanted a new identity in light of the stereotypes of African Americans and wanted to be seen as different, hence taking on new dress, similar to the way they took on new names, the women of my generation wanted to fit in with their Christian peers and look attractive, which meant showing our hair. Realizing this, the women organizing our mosque annual fashion show in Atlanta recruited teen models and speakers for a youth portion of the show. 
In May 1993, a reporter for the Atlanta Journal and Constitution captured their effort to nurture among young women a strong emotional attachment to beautiful Muslim dress. In this picture, the Muslim teens wear African garments. One of the women is my sister, Aisha Kareem. Amira Wazir, the show's organizer and commentator, was quite convincing to the old and young crowd making proclamations like this. We are trendsetters. Europeans have copied Islamic design. We have influenced the garment industry to the point that Islamic style is in. Headwear is in. What we have been doing for years is now vogue. Interestingly, this is one of the photos in the February 2020 issue of Vogue magazine. This model is a Somali Muslim woman, but with that headpiece, she certainly looks like a woman in the nation of Islam. The legacy of Muslim women's efforts to make their daughters not only feel beautiful, but also fit in as Americans in hijab is most noticed and celebrated through Itzi Hajj Muhammad, the first American woman to wear a hijab while competing at the Olympic games. It was her mother determined to have her daughters compete in sports while still covering, who spotted girls fencing at a high school and directed Ipsy Hash to the sport that would make her famous and eventually led to Barbie making its first doll with a hijab. African-American women like Ipsy Hash's mother, Denise, on the left, not only came to Islam because it presented an alternative image of Black women, but also in living out Islam, contributed something new and beautiful to American culture. And in this slide, she is with my mother, Marjorie Kareem, on the right. Finally, I wanted to share this photo of Jada Pinkett Smith. I think it proves that Black American women have a special cultural sensitivity to feel quite comfortable with Islam and in hijab. The third theme connecting what I love in Medina Bay with Black American Muslim women at home is soft gender boundaries between men and women in sacred space. In this slide is a picture of men and women in the Medina Bay mosque courtyard during the Friday congregational prayer. Mosque in general requires some form of gender boundaries because the Muslim prayer ritual requires bodies to touch. However, the traditional etiquette is to limit physical contact, even handshakes between men and women who are not related. This means that men pray next to men and women next to women, with the men praying in the front or rare cases where the groups pray side by side. Unlike dress, Gender boundaries do not attract women to Islam. In fact, the concept of praying behind the men is foreign and strange to many women initially. At the same time, it is not a common deterrent and women eventually understand and agree that it is a practical way to uphold modesty and respect. Women ultimately prefer not to bow and prostrate in front of men. Although gender boundaries are not what attracts Black women to Islam, the way that they navigate them is another example of how they carve out their own cultural expression of Islam. There are extreme cases of gender boundaries where the mosque is not even considered a place for women. And some immigrant women to the United States never attended a mosque in their home country for this reason. Mosques in the US, however, are generally places for women, but the vast majority of immigrant mosques have a curtain or barrier separating men and women. Most African-American mosques do not have a gender barrier, but some do because of immigrant influences, primarily Arab and South Asian. Consider these words by a Black American woman resisting this practice. I don't go to mosques where they got these rags dividing the men from the women. How dare an African American imam divide his woman from a man by putting a partition or rag up? I don't 
dare go to a mosque where I got to sit behind a rag like I'm some inferior being. And here I have come through slavery. I've come across the Atlantic with you on the slave ship, picked cotton with you in the field, saved you from masses whipping and hanging you, and you're going to put me behind a rag because a foreigner comes across the water and tells you that's the setup? Oh, no, not me. I ain't having it. Initially, the mosque in Medina Bay, built in the 1930s, did not have a barrier between the men and women, but was put up in 2008 for political reasons, not cultural. Culturally, men and women are comfortable with soft, fluid gender arrangements, more fluid than anything I've seen in the United States. And this is demonstrated in the mosque courtyard where worshipers can hear everything that goes on inside the masjid through the loudspeakers. In this picture, on one side of the courtyard, women always stand at the front. In other areas outside, women sit behind the men, but their space seems to softly flow into the men. And here's an example of what I mean. There is a woman, then two boys, and then a man with glasses and a mask. They're all in the same row. In the tombs, where space is tighter, we find even more intimacy between men and women. I sit in a space outside the masjid that is dominated by men. And this is during the Magra prayer. So that's why it's, um, it's a little, it's starting to get dark in these photos. Men usually sit alongside the wall, but not shown in this photo. Many nights I have been the only woman in the space. From this spot, you can see into the mosque door and, and the area where the Mu'evin calls the prayer and the Imam leads the prayer. And I like the spot for that reason. I realized that I have become the African-American women I wrote about 20 years ago in my first book, women who thoughtfully and effectively carved a space out for themselves in male-dominated mosque spaces. In my book, I quoted a woman named Zakia, who on occasion visited an immigrant mosque where the women pray separately on the lower level. It's not Islam, Zakia said, to put the sisters in the basement. That's not Islam. When I first moved here in 94, I was too scared to go on the other side where they are serving food where the brothers were. But now at the Juma, I walk right over there. Like Zakia, initially I did not go into this space because I did not see women there, but finally found a way and a place there. The men have warmly welcomed me. I will end this talk with pictures taken in the last two days. Medina Bai's largest spiritual gathering is happening right now which makes it quite a miracle that I am here with you because there's a mini religious pilgrim, pilgrimage beyond these, these doors or this wall. The birthday of the Prophet Muhammad called Maulid will be celebrated tonight. During Maulid season, there are long lines to get into the tombs. And this was just uh, a special prayer um, yesterday morning. Here we see an attempt to separate men and women, but once inside the tomb, this is impossible. In the beginning of Maulid season, which starts at the beginning of Rabbi al-Awwal, which is the birth month of the Prophet Muhammad, women take over the space that I normally sit by myself, especially women pilgrims from Mauritania, which borders at, at the north of Senegal. But as more guests arrive, even the men spill out into this space. Again, notice the soft gender boundaries. More guests arrive, and this was yesterday, men take over the space. But women still... Here, a woman joins a men's vicar or prayer circle formed within the larger crowd. I sit right next to this circle taking the photo. Here is the same woman at a different angle. Note that she is sitting exactly where I sat when I was the only woman. Behind these three women lies a whole section of women. And my very last slide was a picture that I was um, very excited to take yesterday right after 
the Margaret prayer, the sunset prayer, because I had been looking for an image again of the way that men and women kind of naturally flow into each other's face. And the, the, the crowd is just so large that here you have a photo of a woman and a man sitting right next to each other. And I'm pretty sure they were not related. Um, and as many of you know, maybe you, most of you probably wouldn't know, but the Hajj is very similar to this, which is very interesting because we know uh, Saudi Arabia itself is a very conservative Muslim country where men and women are um, separated at, in ex very extreme ways, but just because of the sheer crowds and number of people on the Hajj, it is impossible to really um, kind of direct the space or to impose these, these gender boundaries all the time. So you, you also find um, this kind of soft, um, these soft fluid gender boundaries. And I will end there, thank you. We want to thank doctors, Dr. Hafez and Dr. Karim for their rich presentations where they pretty much deconstructed many of the stereotypes of Muslim women. Now we want to set up a discussion and we're inviting Dr. Hadia Mubarak from the Queen's University of Charlotte and Natana DeLongba from Boston College to join the discussion. So if it's all right, why don't we begin with Hadia and then go to Natana and then we'll have uh, Shireen and Jamila re reply and add their comments as well. So I presume Dr. Kareem is with us and can hear us? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so first of all, thank you both, Dr. Hafiz and Dr. Kareem. Um, very fascinating, um, very fascinating lectures. Um, Dr. Kareem, I, I love how you bring to our attention the historical particularity of the emergence of feminism in the West and also bring to our attention the way um, black and white women experience feminism differently and these expressions of feminism are basically a direct outcome of their distinct historical experiences. I also like to remind my students of the distinct particularity of feminism in the, in the Muslim world, specifically in the late 19th and early 20th century in, West, in which British and French colonialists in specific really appropriated the language of feminism to morally legitimate the project of feminism, which thereby creates a very distinct encounter with feminism in the Muslim world. And I, and I would argue, this is one of the reasons why we still see a lot of pushback against the term feminism or the notion of feminism. Um, and yet, despite this, we've seen an important critical discursive shift, I would say, in, 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 within the context of global feminism with the emergence of Islamic fem feminists. And Islamic feminists who assert within this framework of feminism, their own sort of path of what feminism looks like, one that is relevant to their own cultural and religious um, context and, 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 and authentic. So I, what I would like to ask both of you in this respect is do you find Islamic feminism to be an important sort of framework or discourse? Is it relevant? I mean, there's been a lot of critique of, femini of Islamic feminism on both sides, right, where you have Muslims on one hand pushing back against the concept of feminism at all and saying why use this label and on the other hand you also have critics of Islam say you know Islamic feminism is an oxymoron you can't you can't have an Islamic feminism it's impossible so I would like to ask you both you know I've heard uh, Jamila I think Dr. Kareem I've heard you identify as an Islamic feminist in this talk and and you know in light of what Dr. Hafiz you just spoke about these women in um, Egypt who are in some ways subverting, it seems like, traditional religious authority, but not identifying, you know, it, it's, empowerment is not a distinct goal for this group. I mean, what do we do with this kind of framework of Islamic feminism? Is it useful? Is it effective? Should we just drop it altogether? Um, Professor, would you like to... Uh, Professor sure. Kadim, would you like to go first? Okay, sure. 
Uh, interestingly, I was inspired and I guess um, made, made to feel comfortable with the term Islamic feminism from an advisor at Duke, uh, Miriam Cook, when I was um, working on my doctorate. And um, I was very uh, hesitant to adopt the term um, because in our communities, there is um, just this resistance to the, the label feminism because it is a very loaded term. And you find that like in black communities and Muslim communities and black Muslim communities. So, um, but I, what I quickly discovered was that uh, feminism was a great tool to um, really kind of bring to light some of the arguments that I wanted to make. And uh, Miriam Cook, she specializes in Islamic feminism, and she was indeed the one who uh, talked about the way that Black feminists were inspiring Islamic feminists and was even inspiring her own analysis of uh, Muslim feminists and uh, this idea of you know multiple forms of oppression, right? And so certainly like, Islamic feminism is relevant to, to my analysis of black Muslim women because they are um, they experience oppression based on race, gender, and um, Muslim identity. And then there is the way that those um, identities intersect to produce a specific type of oppression and discrimination. So certainly um, it's, I, I use that in my, my writing um, absolutely. I mean, for this particular presentation, I didn't have the time and space, but it, it, it certainly grounds the work that I do. And that's because, um, like what, what was discussed in Shireen's talk, was that the motivation for these women is piety. It is uh, their relationship. So um, they, they assess they assess women's liberation based foremost on their, their understanding of Islam from the Quran, from the Sunnah, right? And, and it's absolutely critical for them to do so because they realize that to, um, to ensure their rights within Islam and they have to be able to speak the language of Islam. So in other words, the Muslim men that they are, um, you know, in conversation with, even if it's just like on a very practical level in the home, you know, when they're talking to their husbands and <laughs> negotiating certain things that they want, they are going to use the Quran and the Hadith as a source of um, empowerment for them. And, and so it's important also for their credibility as well to be able to say, hey, you know, the Quran says this, the Prophet Muhammad says that. Very beautifully said, Dr. Karim, and I, and I appreciate your analysis and, and you know contextualizing both usages of the term Islamic feminism. So let me also reiterate that you know there are two issues, there are two problems with using the term Islamic feminism. First of all, why are we even debating the term? Why is it important for us to call the efforts of these women feminist or not? And I think um, Professor Karim pointed it out that it's important for her scholarship in the United States to position herself as an Islamic feminist because for her, that somehow frames her work and enables her to make an, uh, an intervention in her field. When we're you know, discussing women's efforts uh, to reform society Islamically in a Muslim majority country, the term feminism has association with colonialism, as you've so deftly pointed out at the, at the onset of your talk. In that sense, uh, feminism uh, is associated with not just colonialism, but also with a westernized uh, perception of women's empowerment in society. So it's, it's, it's regarded with suspicion. Not to mention that here in the United States too, it's regarded with suspicion. I mean, feminists are always saying to younger women, you know, you, you have to really claim your uh, voice and, and, and be feminist and be empowered. And uh, many young women say, no, we're not feminists because they feel like that, you know, somehow uh, prevents them from acquiring some social legitimacies. So asking the question, why do we need to somehow use the, the feminist label when we're looking at uh, women's efforts in Muslim-majority countries? Do we need to uh, legitimize their efforts or their existence as um, activist women in society by slapping on the feminist label? That's, that's the first problem. And then the second problem is that the women themselves are, are saying, 
we are not feminists. That's not our trajectory. And the politicization of, of the term also undermines their efforts, as Professor Karim has pointed out. They are working within social structures that see feminism and regards feminism and westernization with suspicion. And also, you know, they're, they're legitimating their efforts among a patri within a patriarchal structure that regards women's efforts as uh, somehow challenging men's domination. So when you're coming in with with that kind of label, it, it it simply you know is not in their favor. It's not it's not helpful. That actually um, leads up to my question for you. So thank you for that, Dr. Hafiz. Um, throughout your your discussion, I was very struck by the fact that many of the terms that are used in um, academic circles are not necessarily the choice of terms that women would use for themselves. And so along with the question about Islamic feminism comes the question of empowerment and whether that's even an appropriate term to use for analysis given that power seems to be the one thing that they are very concerned about not claiming um, intentionally. And so I wonder what other terminology we might be able to use that would reflect the, what is really at the center of the work here, which is the relationship with God as the primary focus, and then how that moves outward uh, into relationships with other women, with the community, and ultimately more broadly um, within the country, although I, my understanding was that the uh, work you were talking about was more grassroots um, in organization. It's not necessarily looking to have some kind of national impact, um, but really is more focused on uh, individual lives. Um, and then a second question for both of you uh, has to deal with uh, the impact that um, women's work and women's creation of particular spaces and claiming of particular spaces um, has in redefining um, this sort of uh, gendered equation in the sense that women do not exist in a vacuum. They exist in relationships. Um, and Dr. Kareem pointed to this with her discussion of the impact of thinking about um, how we view Muslim men and black men in particular and black boys. I thought you did a wonderful job um, with those images. Uh, those really did speak a million words with the color um, and this idea that even when we're looking at the same picture, we don't necessarily bring the same context with us um, to those pictures. And so it was helpful to have you unpack what you saw in those pictures and why it was so valuable actually to see so many men gathered in the space in the mosque um, as opposed to the perspective of, oh my goodness, look at all the men and there's no space for the women. That, that becomes um, something that demonstrates something that's changing that's very powerful um, in the community. Um, and so I, I just wonder if you might respond to the question of how uh, the claiming of certain spaces uh, by women uh, is um, changing the ways in which men view these women or if that is changing it. So just to begin with, with the question number one, which is what are the terms that we need to be using? And you know, I have a, a short and a, and a long <laughs> answer to that. I think the limitations of scholarship um, has always been finding the language for new interpretations and new critiques of epistemologies of knowledge. Um, we're using the English language to describe many of these activities, and, and these are individuals who live in a country that um, has a very different historical trajectory and different linguistic tradition than the one that we use uh, in the US and, and Western-based scholarship. So this is initially, you know, like one of the biggest challenges is that how you can convey these lives in terms that can be understood and digest and be digested uh, in a, to a Western audience. So it, I'm always up against that. And also as an anthropologist, you're constantly rethinking your own biases and your assumptions and the categories and classifications that you use. So you either invent a new language <laughs> <laughs> so that you can address some of these, um, you know, sort of lived experiences of women that are so different and do not fit at all within the categories, or somewhat fit awkwardly, uh, uh, or maybe even bridge some categories with with others. Um, the fluidity of the experience of the lived experience has always been difficult to capture in language. Uh, let alone when you are discussing people who do not belong, uh, belong to a particular linguistic tradition. Uh, so rather than be impeded by that, I think that 
one of the best ways to do this is to involve yourself in critique. You critique, you use the terms that are available to you, but you always point out their limitations. And that is something that I always advise my students to do. I always say, you know, whenever you talk about Islam, you talk about Islamic faith, Islamic practices, Islamic teachings, Islamic behaviors, rather than talk about an Islam, or Islam is this or Islam is that, because Islam itself is not this, you know, sort of anachronistic, you know, unchanging category. I mean, um, Asma was talking earlier about Talal Asad's work, and I'm a great fan of his work, and he's, you know, always pointed our attention to the fact that Islam is a discursive tradition. So it keeps changing. It is not this frozen, uh, you know, category in history that um, it remained unchanged since the time of the Prophet, for example. It keeps, I mean, we've just seen, you know, two examples, Islam in Egypt, Islam in Senegal, um, Islam in the United States. I mean, there are so many, and, and many Muslims here uh, who come from various traditions and various, uh, you know, sort of uh, dispositions and, and behaviors. So we cannot, we cannot use the term Islam without putting parentheses, you know. We, we have to be careful about how we use things like Muslim women. Um, but I'm not saying that, uh, so we can't invite, since we can't invent a new language, we should always position ourselves very clearly in what we write and talk about and and point out what the limitations of the of the words that we use are and that's what I try to do uh, so rather than just throw away empowerment completely try to define it and and make and, and and point out what the limitations of the terms are when we're when we're examining women who are operating within a different context than the one uh, that provided um, you know the word empowerment in the linguistic tradition, in its linguistic tradition. So, um, yes, your question, thank you. And it, um, it speaks to also what I wanted to, uh, some follow-up comments to the first question. And that is that, or follow-up comments is that, yeah, I, I said I could call myself an Islamic feminist sometimes. And I found that as the years pass by, I, I tend to, to use that word less and less. So maybe another way to talk about it rather than around time is that um, my participation in the Muslim communities, um, as it increases, that I, I kind of distance myself <laughs> from the term. But again, it's really hard to I don't even know if that really captures what's happening because even always in my research, I've always been a part of these communities, right? My, my work also is, very, is ethnographic and I talked about, you know, um, this um, insider participation. So, um, so I've all, I guess I've always been kind of negotiating it, but I would just say that more and more I, I face that challenge of communities, individuals who have a problem with the term feminism and especially when the goal or one of the goals is to transform these communities, right? Um, or to, um, to, to, you know, to honor the structures that are already going on in these communities and these families. And then, but to maybe perhaps, perhaps um, elevate in some way, right? That you, you have to, again, you have to honor what's already present, right? So if you wanna have a conversation again with Muslim men, then, uh, and, and, and to kind of change their minds about certain things, that if the term feminism is um, causing, you know, a lot of discomfort, maybe it's not the best way to approach this kind of change. So, you know, I've struggled a little bit with that. And I actually, I've, you know, I've had conversations with actually Dr. Sherman Jackson. Um, uh, we were actually at a, an event in Atlanta and um, he was, cause he was, um, he was just, I think I had recently written a blog piece and he was um, encouraging me to continue to, um, you know, to use the terminology when it's helpful. But at the same time, you know, again, always recognizing um, the people that I'm talking to. So in other words, he was encouraging me to continue to do what I do. So that's one thing. Yeah, I, I definitely see his limitations. In terms of like alternate um, alternate terminology, I'm not so sure about that, but if I just think about some of the efforts in our communities and the kinds of language that's used, I think women do feel comfortable with um, 
women's advancement, women's leadership, absolutely. Uh, women's presence, women's increased presence. So again, these aren't like exactly terms, alternative terms to feminism, but again, um, you know, ways to kind of have these conversations. So um, in both black and immigrant communities and, you know, all kinds of Muslim communities in America, and um, like there's been this move to have an increase of women's participation, you know, on panels. So, um, you know, it's really interesting to me because, you know, when I see those type of efforts to me, it's just very obvious that, you know, this is feminism, right? And so, and so, but at the same time, um, I get, again, those, those limitations, but, you know, to just uh, to continue to um, find ways that we can, you know, bring tools from academia and, and also kind of be in coalition with these communities in ways that are, that are comfortable and actually, um, you know, um, transformative. Uh, in terms of space, yeah, it's really interesting. If I understand your question correctly, it's like, how do women, you know, really being in these spaces, taking over these spaces, you know, I, I you know, how does that really have, how does it have an impact? And I, I love to watch, for instance, the Mauritanian women come into that space. And um, I think what's really interesting too is like this convergence of different um, women who coming from different cultures with different mindsets. Because when I see the Mauritanian women, I, I get this sense that um, they don't really care <laughs> about um, these boundaries. Actually, I shouldn't say that. Now I wouldn't say that they don't care, but I feel like they feel very comfortable about you know being in the space and um, and taking over. <laughs> um, just yesterday, when we were in the crowd there were um, two Senegalese women praying next to me. And um, I could tell some of the men had asked some of the women to move um, from the front because the brothers were still trying to come through. And <laughs> they, they may try to make us move too. And so she just gestured to me, oh, just um, you know, move the prayer rug like like an inch, maybe maybe it was a foot, like just move it over a little <laughs> from the men. So I, I really appreciated that because she was basically saying, hey, I'm not moving and these men are gonna have to figure out something else. And um, so, yeah, so it's really awesome, you know, when you have the language barriers, culture barriers, you see this common sense of, um, hey, you know, I have, I have a right, I have a, yeah, I have a right to this space. And I was here first, right? That's another thing. We, we came early to make sure we have a good space and the men come at the last minute. And because men are used to getting what they want in these spaces, they think they can just kind of come through and move the women. So, um, so yeah, I think it's particularly important, even with you know how I said at first, I was hesitant to, to move into that space. It's really interesting that um, when I got here in January, there were three Mauritanian women who would sit in that space. So what it appears like, so there was the, the Maulid, this big you know, religious festival of the birth of the prophet, celebrating the birth of the prophet that happened like end of October last year. So I'll make this quick, I'm running over time. But basically these women were still left over from the convention. They basically stayed in Senegal for three months. And they, it, was, it was just these three women. And it was an African-American brother who told me that um, our sheikh enters the mosque over on that side and that these Mauritanian women, he speaks to these women. And it was actually a young brother uh, or a peer of mine. So anyway, and then it was a, it was a, a African-American Muslim man who was encouraging me to enter that space. And again, I was very hesitant at first. So I guess what I'm saying too, is that just like the women being present also is having an impact on the men and also other women gathering the courage to, to be in that space. And at the same time, also like our access, well, one, our, our, our pursuit of knowledge, of closeness to, to scholars, to saints. And so that piety also moving us to, uh, to cross these, these boundaries. Your insights, is this on? Your insights and also the cautions you've given us in terms of how to think about the terminology are incredibly valuable. Um, does any, our time is up, but do any of you have something you'd like to say in 30 seconds or so? Any final 
I mean, cautions or ideas? Well, this was just a thought, but I don't know if you have time to answer it, but I was in regards to Dr. Hafez's piety, uh, depiction of this piety group, I, I can't help but wonder to what extent is there emphasis on self-transformation rather than societal transformation rather than empowerment, of how, how much of that is a function of their, her, their religious and political context in which the only way to really function peacefully and legally as a religious group in Egypt would mean to downplay the idea that they want to really upset the current structures of power and therefore it's just about self-transformation and piety, right? I knew someone was going to ask the question. <laughs> um, so it, I think this is really relevant because the situation in Egypt obviously now uh, post-revolution and, and post-military, um, you know, sort of coup, um, there is a curtailment of the, the religious in the public sphere. Um, however, this has been, you know, kind of an on and off situation in Egypt for a long time, where uh, sometimes, you know, the presence of Islamism in the public is tolerated, sometimes it's not, you know, so it, it, it does vary from time to time. And uh, I have asked many of the members of this particular association if they've ever been approached by, uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> their uncle, right? So they call them the, the, the uncle, right? The uncle, <laughs> or, you know, like the secret police. Big brother. Uh, and they have actually, on more than one occasion, been visited by uh, individuals dressed in civilian clothing. But of course, they stood out and they could recognize that some of the individuals in the audience, for example, were actually working for the, um, you know, sort of the Mukhabarat, which is uh, intelligence. Um, so they are aware of that. However, because of the fact that they are women, they're not really perceived to have any sort of, uh, to pose any political danger to the, inv uh, to the government. So in a way, their gender works in their favor in that instance, where they're, they're seen as, you know, harmless. But the project that the, w that the women are really pursuing is Islamically reforming society. I mean, that is first and foremost one of their main goals. Um, it starts with the individual, but then it ends with the community. And that, you know, when you read, you know, um, the Mus about the Muslim Brotherhood, it's really also addressing the same issue where you start with yourself and then, you know, eventually it becomes like a bigger movement and uh, it affects the entire uh, society. So in so many ways, um, yes and no, they are not consciously political because of perhaps fear of being, you know, uh, scrutinized by the government, but also, on the other hand, they genuinely believe that it has to start with the individual, and the personal is political after all, so. Thank you so much for helping us enlarge the way we think about things that we don't necessarily think about too well. And Dr. Kareem, thank you so much for joining us at a Sounds like you're up at midnight talking to us. So, and thank you all on the panel.